Okay, now, first off, how long do you wait if you're not healed? When do you go and get more prayer? Often as you want, as quick as you want. But go to people you trust that will get the job done, right? Uh, don't, and if somebody prays for you and they pray a prayer of doubt and unbelief, don't go back to them. Go to somebody else and you know, tell, them, <laughs> tell them what you want them to pray, you know, to pray in faith. Also, you, um, well, when you go to people, Jesus ministered to a man more than once, the blind guy. Remember, he prayed for him, basically, and then did it again. And so there was progression, but if he did it twice, then you can do it twice, right? The idea that you can only pray once and you can't pray again sounds good, but it's just not technically biblical, right? All right, now, I, you know, if, if, we, if you pray once and they get healed, then yeah, don't pray again. So, okay? But if they don't, you pray again because you add two. Now, uh, it says, Brother Curry, do you take people on for internships? Yes, we do. Actually, we just, just started really doing this um, because I just really realized that we can't get it all done ourselves. And so we are, I'm looking, we're, really what I'm looking to do is put together a team pretty much everywhere we go. Uh, we, you know, not just in the continent, but I mean, literally like a team here, one in Adelaide, one in Perth, one in uh, Brisbane or, or in uh, Toowoomba. Uh, you know, just so we're, we're starting to put these teams together and we're looking at, I'd put, um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, just get in touch with me. Uh, you can email me, curryblake at gmail.com. That's the fastest way to get it to me. But w- I would definitely talk to you about it. We'd put out a call recently and I'd actually said that I was looking for uh, a couple of young men that were preferably unmarried and without debt, really, and that, you know, you were, could support yourself, essentially. But, um, you know, we can make arrangements and stuff, but we do want teens. And that way, when I do come into the country, I would have two to four people that could travel with me everywhere I went. We would just, I mean, now, if you're going to come along, this is what we're going to talk about. I, I'm not interested in talking about other stuff, Okay. Uh, I don't have time for it. I wasted too many years, you know, unrenewing my mind. Now I would just spend my time renewing my mind. Amen. And so I, I, I really don't care about anything else. Now, <clears throat> I enjoy life. And if you're around me much, you'll see I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy. I am blessed. I live a, a blessed life. I mean, it's, it's amazingly simple and easy. Um, but this is what I do. And it's what I think about. And if, I, if I'm not talking it, I'm thinking it. Okay? So that's just what it is. So if you're interested in something like that, just give me, you know, give me an email or something, and uh, we can talk about it. And that way, when I do start coming over, when I got here, or when I get here, then uh, we'd probably take two or four people, and they would just be with us all the time and then travel with me wherever I go, and we would just take time to fellowship and pour in and talk and get the job done. Amen? Because that's what that we want to make sure that we are discipling and doing the job, getting the job done. Because I can't stay here, so we've got to have people that can do it. Amen? So, okay. Now, if you're a husband and wife team, that's possible too, uh, that kind of thing. But we just have to talk and see how we can work it out. Usually when I come overseas, it's funny because so far, every time I've come to Australia, I have come by myself except the very first time. And that time, there was a young man that came with me. And we ended up spending our whole, the whole week I was here in our hotel room because of the, the meetings didn't work out and the people that were supposed to set up didn't and it wasn't good. So, uh, <clears throat> so we ended up sitting the whole time in our hotel room and then, well, we walked around Sydney for a little bit and that was about it. But, um, you know, we don't, usually when I go overseas, either my son, my daughter, or my wife or any combination of all three of them end up going with me. And so the next time I come over, I'm sure either my daughter, my wife, my son will come with me. But um, we do want to work in teams. It's good to have teams, people that work together good. Um, So anyway, now, next. I had another one I thought. Nope, we got that. Okay. Yes. Can sexual abuse and satanic ritual abuse victims be instantly healed? Yes. Are there hooks? Yeah, but it's not 
One of the things that the church is missing is dramatic conversions. And by the same token, when you, if there's not, I'm not saying they have to be dramatic, but I'm just saying you, a lot of times you don't see that anymore. And usually, to the degree a person is immediately saved or converted, that's how they run the rest of their life. A lot of times. Now, I'm not saying it has to be that way, but I'm just saying it does work that way a lot. Uh, secondly, is that um, <clears throat> after that, here's another problem. We have reached a point where the baptism of the Spirit is no longer seen as important. And because of that, people do not receive the baptism of the Spirit. And I'm using the terminology that is generally in the church, whether it's necessarily right or wrong, you know what I'm talking about. And many people now don't receive the, the true baptism, but they basically, and I'm opening up a can of worms here. <laughs> it, it's, we got a lot of people that speak in tongues that didn't baptize in the Spirit. Okay? Simple as that. The baptism in the Spirit is for power, not for tongues. Now, tongues accompany it, but tongues alone does not automatically signify it. All right, you understand? In other words, when you get baptized in the Spirit, you will speak in tongues. But just because you speak in tongues don't, doesn't mean that you're baptized in the Spirit. Now, that's not the way it's supposed to be, but that's the way it is. Uh, Dr. Lake had a woman with him in Africa that was one of his secretary. Her name was uh, Miss Emma Louise Wick. And years later, he wrote a, a uh, letter, and he was talking about some people, and they said, he said, yeah, they had a Miss Wick type of baptism. And what he was referring to is the fact that he said that she had the ability to get people to speak in tongues without receiving the baptism of the Spirit. That's what the church is. Now, if we have the same spirit that Jesus had, then that same spirit should produce the same works. And according to Jesus, greater works. All right? Now, one of the things we started noticing in South Africa was I was bringing this up and began praying for people for the baptism of the spirit, people that spoke in tongues. And a couple of them were actually our, some of our leadership there. And it was amazing because as soon as we did that, instantly there was a greater degree of power in their life and ministry even while I was there. And then one of the things they started noticing is even when people came up for healing, a lot of times they would ask them, have you been baptized in the Spirit? And they would say yes. And they said, would you, would you like a new baptism? And they would say, well, yeah. And they would pray for them. And I mean, we saw some amazing things taking place. And so there, we have to get back to some of our beginnings, some of our roots, as we would say. And some of that is some of the, the very basics. Most Christians have a hodgepodge theology. They don't know what happened when or where, and they, can't, they know some of the stories in the Old Testament, but they can't tell where Samson was. Was he before David, after David? Where was Moses? See, he was and they can't tell you. And it's because they hear stories, but they haven't studied the Bible to know when it happened. Now, because of that, we've also gotten away from some of the foundational doctrines of the church. The early church was based upon some very basic things, which included, number one, of course, salvation. Salvation from sin, out of sin, right? And secondly was a, a sanctification that literally separated you from the world, now, that does not mean that you didn't witness to them and go into the world and to minister to people, but you weren't part of them, right? You didn't do what they did and that you were separate from them and that marked holiness. Then after that, so you had salvation, then you had sanctification, then you had the baptism in the Spirit. In the early days, they thought sanctification was the baptism in the Spirit. Then they found that it wasn't and then the Pentecostal movement started. And so then after baptism in the Holy Spirit, then healing. So those were the four fundamental things that really was the push behind the Pentecostal movement and even the, book, the church in the book of Acts. You know? And it's funny because people talk about the church in the book of Acts like it was the end all, but in reality, the book of Ephesians 
or the church in Ephesians is the end all. all right? It's not about us going back to the book of Acts. The book of Acts was a baby church. They were trying to figure things out and they were writing the books as they went along. The book of Ephesians was written while Paul was walking in the book of Acts. Right? So you can go back and you can read when these things were done. They didn't have it all worked out. They had mis- mistakes, they had problems, they had fights, they had you know, splits in their team. They had arguments going on. So these guys didn't have it all together. They were messed up. But at the same time, they were walking it out. And, but it was marked by those four things. And I believe that if we're going to see a real move of God in these last days, we're going to have to return to those four things and, and really go after that. Now, <clears throat> Wigglesworth said that he foresaw a time in the future when it would be very hard to get people healed. He said, because they will have too many th- other things to lean on. Now, that's, that's what it is. Now, see, there was a question about, oh, about, it said uh, about mental depression, things like that. When you pray for somebody, you know, physical healing is pretty easy to see, but sometimes internal things you can't see. So if you pray for somebody with depression, uh, they give them medicine that, okay, listen, medicine does not heal. Medicine, all it does is mask the symptoms. It may deaden some things so that the demon cannot work through you, right, to do those things. But it is also not, <clears throat> it sometimes immobilizes a part of the body or the brain <clears throat> that will allow the body not to do what it was doing. So it doesn't heal, but sometimes it makes it where the body is immobilized long enough for it to heal itself. The medicine didn't heal. The medicine just basically made the body <clears throat> so that the demon couldn't use that part of the body long enough for the body to get healed. Okay, there's a little more to it than that, but that's the fastest way I can say it. But as you start to, and the question was, you know, how can you tell unless you just stop taking the medicine? Should you quit taking the medicine until you do that? Now, number one, you got to know this. If you're going to be dealing with people and dealing in healing, and ministering to people. You cannot tell them what to do with their medicine. You cannot comment on it, right? If you came up to me and said, uh, I was prayed for, but I take medicine, should I keep taking it? I cannot answer that, right? I'm not a doctor. It's real simple. So I'm not going to tell you what to do with medicine, okay? And I hope doctors don't tell you what to do with Jesus, (laughs) right? If they'll stay out of my business, I'll stay out of theirs. All right, real simple. Now, the reason I say that is because there's a lot of controversy with it. Usually, the problem is this. People think that if they quit taking their medicine, it will cause the healing to take place. Like they're twisting God's arm to make him do it. It, it, That that isn't the way it works, okay? Now, I will tell you this. Number one, medicine cannot stop the power of God, right? <clears throat> if you're taking medicine, you get prayed for. When your body is healed, your body will react to your medicine, right? At that point, that'd be a good time to decide what to do with your medicine. Now, people ask me what I've done or where I stand, and if I tell you, then that's like me telling you what to do. But it's not. You understand? Because I made a decision. Really, the main reason I made the decision I made concerning medicine had nothing to do with the medicine or my belief as, as far as healing. What it had to do with was my responsibility that I had for people. Now, the I had made a decision that I would not take medicine. Now, but now you got to realize this. I came to that conclusion after many years of study and practice and seeing it work. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you wait. I'm not telling you to do that. But I will, I will say that the key has been that medicine... To me, 
it, it would be hypocritical for me to tell you to trust God and me take medicine. Right? That's where I'm at. Now, at the same time, I know people that have tried to do stuff like that because they heard, well, this testimony, this guy broke his glasses. God healed his eyes. And so people break their glasses and then they try to drive home. <clears throat> All right? So, you know, if you're going to do that, just give me a 30-minute head start. All right? So that's <laughs> Now, <clears throat> breaking your glasses does not heal your eyes. Believing God heals your eyes. All right? Now, at the same, by the same token, you taking medicine isn't going to stop the power of God. Okay? That pill or that medicine is not more powerful than God. Now, <clears throat> here's where the devil will try to do something. He will try to back you into a corner where you will make a certain commitment that will, again, back you into a corner to where when you back down off that commitment, it damages your faith. Technically, there's nothing in the Bible that says don't take medicine, okay? Now, there is a lot there about they didn't trust God, but they leaned upon the arm of the flesh, and they went to physicians, and there is stuff like that, okay? What I'm saying is, let me put it this way. I had I made a stand against medicine, mainly because I studied a lot about medicine and found out that most of it is a farce anyway. <clears throat> and even diagnosis is guesswork, okay? And there's a lot of stuff there, and usually what you're suggested to take is whatever the doctor will get a kickback for. Okay, simple as that. Okay, when they have medicine thing commercials on TV that says, ask your doctor if you can take this. My doctor ought to be telling me what I need, not me telling my doctor, right? If he's the one that went out through all the schooling for it, I shouldn't have to suggest to him what I need. He ought to know what I need. And if he doesn't, he's not worth being my doctor, okay? Now, <clears throat> based on that, medicine, for instance, I made the stand that I did because... I didn't want to tell people to trust God and then me not trust God under those same circumstances. You know? So I've had to make a stand in pretty much every area because I didn't, what, and many of you maybe have heard my testimony about when I broke my foot. Well, I could have went to the doctor and got it set. I could have went and, and nobody would have thought anybody because for some reason a broken bone doesn't seem to be the same as sickness to people. You know, so you can do things like that. Well, and nobody would have said anything. <clears throat> but I had prayed for people before with broke bones. And so to me, it wouldn't be right for me to pray for somebody's foot if I'm going to go get mine set. And so when I broke my foot, I didn't go get it set. I prayed over it. I blasted it with prayer. I slapped it, you know, and it was broken, swollen, and I almost passed out. Now, I'm not kidding, Okay. So, as I'm telling you, I've done things I hope you never have to do, okay? <clears throat> and, but I made that stand because of the position I was in of praying for people. That I never wanted to be praying for somebody and telling them to trust God whenever I knew I'd just gone to a doctor for it. Now, I would say this. I, d I have not let the devil back me into a corner to where he tries to use that against me. For instance, <clears throat> like I said, I don't use medicine, but... I've not said I will never use it under any circumstances. Now, that's the way I feel. But if you, once you say that, now the devil's got a starting point to work against you. Now, you may believe that, but until you make that stand, then the devil doesn't really have anything to use against you because you got nothing to lose if you do use medicine. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> it's a law. Once you make it a law, the devil can use it against you. Why? Because once you violate the law, now your conscience is going to condemn you. Why? Because there's no sin, there's no transgression until you violate the law. Well, but it's not a law God made, it's a law you made. You see? So that's what you're trying to do. Now, let's say I was going to come out here and do a healing service. And for whatever reason, man, just, uh, you know, I was asleep and I woke up and just this tremendous headache. Right? 
And I mean, so bad, uh, you know, you can't think type of headache. You know what I'm saying? Everything's dark and all that kind of stuff. And you just get, and, oh man, well, I'm just going to pray for 500 people, right? Which could take a couple hours. Now I got a choice. Can I get rid of a headache? Yeah. You know, I can get rid of a headache. I've done it before. I, I'll be honest with you, I am extremely blessed. I really don't fight much for myself. I seldom, seldom have to fight for myself. I, I really, almost all my fighting for sickness and disease is other people. The devil really doesn't hit me with sickness and disease. Now, I'm not saying it hadn't always been that way. You know, there was times when we had to fight some stuff, but a lot of it was my own family and my kids and different things like that. <clears throat> but for me, mostly, I, I've always been generally healthy anyway. But even after I started learning some of this, even then, it was, things were fairly easy to beat. Well, if, so if a headache came and it was like that, now I got two choices. Take the time and go in and fight. Now, if it happens just for a healing service, then it's probably not just a headache. You understand? It's something to get me off my game. Something to distract me. Something where I'm not focused, where I'm not really, where I'm not thinking about the people, and I'm because my I'm, my attention's on me. Now, <clears throat> if that's the case, then I, yeah, I could stop and pray. Headache, go in Jesus' name. You leave now. All pain, go. Whatever it is. Okay. Now, if if I've got an hour before the healing service, no problem. I'll hang on, wait and see. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, 10 minutes to time to go, still there. Okay, well, still not gone. I want to be able to focus. Okay, what are, uh, Advil, Tylenol, whatever it is. Yeah, no problem. Now, understand, I've not done that. But if I needed to do that, I would have no problem doing it so that my mind would be clear so that I could focus on the people. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'm trying to be just real honest and I'm, I'm trying to show you, don't let the devil back you into a corner that God hasn't designed. Right? Because he would rather me not use medicine. Right? And keep hurting and not focus and not get 500 people healed so that I would keep my stand rather than me taking medicine, you know, taking an Advil or whatever you want to call it, one of those things, <clears throat> and getting rid of that thing so that I can focus and get 500 people healed. You see the difference? So what I'm saying is you decide where you walk. Don't let somebody else's walk decide for you. Okay? Come to your own conclusions. And so, but I, I've always been somewhat like that anyway. I've never... Um, I just, I don't believe in a lot of um, extras, I guess you would say it, you know? <clears throat> I see people all the time using chapstick or something. You know, I'm not against, I understand, I'm not putting down chapstick, <laughs> okay? But anything you do, the body adapts to it. And so if you use chapstick, then your body will quit producing moisture for your lips, and then you have to use it. You understand? If you use eye drops because your eyes get dry, well then, at first, that may help a little bit, but over a period of time, your eyes will quit producing tears, and then now you have to use it. So I've just never been one to when something like that happened to just jump in and grab something and use it. It's just kind of like, nope, you're going. I've had stuff going on, and people say, well, that's what that is. I'm like, really? I didn't know that, and it just went on. You know, why? Because I just don't think that way. I, I don't, um, <clears throat> to me it's easier just to keep walking. You know, so just don't let the devil back in your corner. Does this make sense to you? You understand that? Just walk with God and, you know, as I would tell people, again, when it comes to children, you know, if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to step out in faith, trust God, great, I'm all for it, right? Uh, you know, if you get sick, Fever, pain, fine. We'll pray. You know, you're an adult. You can decide. If at some point you decide, I can't take it anymore, I want medicine, fine. Okay, no problem. You can tell us. If it's a child, 
You pray, you get results. If you don't get results, you get help. You understand? I have no problem with that. Why? Because no child should suffer because of your lack of faith. Right? Live to fight another day. A child can always tell you what they're feeling. You have to go the extra mile for them. Right? That's where, see, people in the healing ministry have done stupid things and, and brought a lot of flack, you know, in the area of healing that didn't need to be. And so, you know, if it's for somebody else, I mean, I, I'll stand with you as far as you want to go. You know? And I know as far as I will go. <clears throat> when it comes to a child, I don't take chances like that. I will pray for a child. I'll, now, I say that. <laughs> like I said, I've done things I wouldn't want you to do. When my first daughter died, <clears throat> she did not die from the tumor. She actually died from double pneumonia. And she developed it literally overnight. And we called the doctor. <clears throat> At that point, we were just, like I said, trying to learn about healing. And she had a high fever. And we called him, and we were a good ways out of town. And he said, well, just keep her cool and bring her in in the morning. Well, in the morning when we woke up, she was dead. And so I got to admit, that kind of put a bad taste in my mouth toward doctors, right? Because he didn't want to get out of bed. And so <clears throat> I know all not that way, okay? But after that, now Erica died February of 81. Crystal, my third child, second daughter, was born in... October, October 20th of that same year. And right after she was born, it's funny because she is an identical twin of the one that died. Identical twin, okay? I have their picture side by side. You can look at them. It's, it's really amazing. And of all my kids, Crystal is the only one that we've ever had to fight pneumonia over. The identical twin, the, the same thing that killed the first one, tried to kill the second one. And so we, but now, <clears throat> I, I made the statement before. God gave my kids to me. He didn't give them to a doctor. They are my responsibility. I decide when I hand over my authority over that child to somebody else. Okay? One of our problems in society is we keep giving all of our authority over to other people to do things for us, and now we cannot even fend for ourselves. Okay, because we're dependent on somebody else to do it for us. Now, <clears throat> because of that, and because my first daughter died, whenever Crystal developed pneumonia, there was an instant fear, instantly, of here we go again. And, but the first one we had done, we, we did everything we were told to do, and it didn't work. And so by the time Crystal was old enough and started getting, it would, would get sick with the money. About once or twice a year, it would just hit her. None of the other kids. <clears throat> so I made a decision at one point. We'd, we'd started looking at this, you know, at, at healing as a whole. We said, that's it. We're done with doctors. And so <clears throat> at that time, right after that, of course, is when Crystal got hit with pneumonia. And so we did everything we knew to do, you know, kept her cool, prayed for her, did everything. But I'll never forget it. That that night, she developed, she started developing pneumonia. <clears throat> Once she developed it, and we were about 30 miles away from another town, we took her to the hospital. Now, this is before this last incident. We took her to the hospital. They did an x-ray on her. Her lungs were filling up. And they could tell it. They said, you can wait till we get an ambulance here, which could take a little while because it's got to come from the other town. Or you can take her to the hospital yourself in the other town, 35 minutes away. <clears throat> we said, we'll take her. We put her in the car, drove there, prayed in tongues, laid hands on her all the way there. When we got her there, they did an x-ray. They held the x-rays together and they said, uh, we don't know why y'all came here because she is perfectly clear. <laughs> Amen? I mean, completely healed in the 35-minute process. Now, <clears throat> later, she was, same situation came up, and it was it was rough situation. Uh, she had the same rattle in her chest that my first daughter had. 
And we prayed, we did everything we knew to do, and then finally it was getting late, so we said, you know, <clears throat> we've been taught, you pray, you believe, then you act like it's true, you know, and then you're acting the word. And so our bed was right down the hall from each other, it's just about five or six feet away, I mean, from the rooms, so there's a little bitty hallway in between. So we started, we prayed, <clears throat> put her to bed, went in, my wife was, needless to say, very concerned about the situation. And, you know, kept saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I said, we've done what we're supposed to do. She said, yeah, but she's still just, well, what, what are we going to do? You know, we've done it. Having done all to stand, stand. Right? Where people make their mistake is once they've done everything the Bible says to do, the devil doesn't budge, and then you start trying to figure out other things to do. And as soon as you start doing that, you move from faith to unbelief. Right? <clears throat> Immediately, see what the devil wants to do is to get you to move, to get you to try to figure out what do we not do right? What do we not do enough? And as soon as you act on that, you're beat. So at some point, you just have to stop and just go, you know what? We've done what the Bible said to do. That's what we do. <clears throat> so we did that. Put her to bed. When you turn out the lights, every sound is amplified. And so I could hear that rattle from her room to ours. <clears throat> I laid there, I prayed, I prayed in tongues, I prayed in English, I did everything I could do, mainly so that I wouldn't hear her. And then finally I had to put a pillow over my head so that I could go to sleep. Finally I dozed off. <clears throat> Next morning when I woke up, See, the only thing worse than hearing that sound is not hearing it. And when I woke up, I didn't hear it. So I'd been taught about how to act in faith and how not to act out of fear. So I knew if I went straight to her room, that would have been out of fear rather than faith. So I got up and did my morning normal routine, went in the kitchen, got a Coke. That's... <clears throat> First thing I do, okay? And, and I really don't care if you like that or not, okay? And I still don't eat vegetables, and I've never eaten them, okay? So, I'm sorry, I should have told you if you have children to put your finger in your ears, I'm sorry. But, I, um, but it's funny, everybody tells me I ought to eat right, but it's the people that are in my healing line. So, <laughs> so when I'm in your healing line, then you tell me how to eat, okay? <laughs> when you're in my healing line, don't tell me. No. So then I go, finally, when I was convinced that if I went to her room, it would not be out of fear, I went into her room, and she wasn't in bed. She was on the floor beside the bed, sitting up, playing, perfectly healed. <clears throat> now, from that time to this, Really, yeah, from that time to this. Maybe once or twice after that, we had to fight it. But it really, from that time to this, that was it. Right? I mean, we have, <clears throat> we've had other situations in our family, but um, it's really not much of a fight anymore. It's pretty much, oh, no, you don't. You know? It's kind of like a dog coming into your house. You just stomp your foot and yell and tell it to get and that's what it does. Now, there's things <clears throat> you fight, and one of the things we've learned is I travel. The enemy tries to stir up things back home. Every time I leave, out of the, especially out of the country, the enemy tries to do something back home to try to, you know, counterattack. And I, I've already told my family, I said, <laughs> you're a target. You know? And that's what my wife, usually that's what she does. She'll call me and says, what's going on over there? I said, meetings, why? It's good. She said, it must be, because we're going through hell back here. <laughs> so, I said, whose fault is that? All you got to do is get strong. He comes after the weakest link. Just make sure you're not the weakest link, right? <clears throat> make sure it's your next door neighbor. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but we, we've seen that kind of thing where the enemy does come in and try to attack. And <clears throat> even in our SWAT training, we emphasize that. The, the SWAT training is our spiritual warfare training. 
it basically tells you how the enemy thinks and how he tries to attack. But the main thing is it, it shows you what to anticipate so that you can hit it off and you can see patterns. You know, uh, for instance, you, a, a missionary comes in and you say, I want to support them for $100 a month. And <clears throat> as soon before you write your first check, now he may not be able to hit you because you're, maybe you're protected. Maybe you stay in the word. You know, you're, you're in that place where he can't touch you. <clears throat> so he goes the next step down and starts looking at which one of your kids isn't necessarily living right or something. And he may not be able to touch them, but he will throw, you know, just eat up their transmission in their car. And who are they going to come to? Dad, I need a new transmission. What? And if you pay for it, guess what? Guess what gets left out? The missionary. See, that's an indirect attack. And you can start to see it. One of the things you can see, how many of you had a hard time getting here? Look at the hands. <laughs> Why? He don't want you here. Real simple. You understand? He fights for you to get places. I've told people before, you ever, remember the old Star Wars trilogy or <laughs> whatever it is now? Six, eight, ten, I don't know how many they got. All right. Remember when Luke was going to leave his training? He hadn't finished the training yet, and they said, don't leave, finish your training, right? Why? Because they tried to, the dark side tried to pull him off, right, before he finished his training. I've told people so many times, listen, <clears throat> don't be surprised when after you get here, things start happening back home. You know, things happen to try to get you to leave the training early. Why? Because the enemy does not want you to know this. So he tries to do things. We were in New York one time, and I got a call in our house. The water heater in our house had just, you know, broke. I mean, just water everywhere. <clears throat> we had water all through our house. Now, in my home, I have a lot of books. And a lot of them are over 100, some of them are over 150 years old. There are a lot of them that cannot be replaced. And in my room, my office room, I wish I could say they were all in bookshelves and neat, but they're not. They're all over the floor, you know, because I'll sit in the floor and go through them and look this here, and, you know, it's like a kid with his toys, you know, around. That's, that's my toys, okay? And so I got all these books stacked up in my floor, and I get a call that our water heater broke, and it flooded our house. So the first thing I'm thinking about is my books, <clears throat> when we got home, the water, we were renting the house, but the water had gone all through the living room, all through the kitchen, ruined the carpet, ruined the linoleum stuff in the kitchen, went down the hall, went into the rooms. When it got to my door, stopped at the door. <laughs> Amen? Did not go into the door at all. <clears throat> My wife was not all that excited about that. Because <laughs> the first thing she said was, well, we know where your priorities are. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, I mean, I could, I could tell you all kinds of things. See, well, the thing you're going to have to get past is that <clears throat> we tend to think that Walking in power is hard. You have to build up to it or that it's this hard walk. And it's almost as if, well, God will only do it if it's nothing for me, but it's for other people and I can maybe pull it out of him. Like he's some cheap miser, you know, that's holding on to everything. And we got to remember, he started all this. This was his idea. Laying hands on the sick was his idea. It wasn't ours. We didn't write the Bible. He put it in there. That was his, So people say, well, you know, the sovereignty of God, you're overruling the sovereignty of God. No, no. The sovereignty of God decided to put this in the Bible. So the sovereignty of God is not the fickleness of God. 
which means he can change his mind and do what he wants to do. That's not the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is that he thinks so far ahead that he knows what to put in here that will apply to every situation. And so <clears throat> when you start looking at that, you have to realize that God wants you doing this. He, he wants you to walk in more power than you ever thought was even possible. Right? Well, maybe he can do, maybe he'll use me like that if I can, you know, get small enough or maybe if I die enough or if I'm, you know, get spiritual enough. None of those are true. Right? He, he told the Corinthians, the carnal Corinthians, how to operate in the gifts. And they were carnal. They weren't even spiritual. He said, I can't even give you meat. I can only give you milk. And then he described the gifts of the Spirit. Right? Now, what you have to realize is that it brings glory to God. He said, let your works, let your light, so, you know, shine before men, that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what do we do? First thing, well, I can't do anything in public because somebody will see. They're supposed to see. That's why they're called signs. Amen? God wants to show off. He just can't find anybody to show off through. The eyes of the Lord roam true and fro upon the face of the earth, looking for those in whom he can show himself strong. He's looking for people to stand up and go, here I am. Be strong through me. Amen? Now, what you've got to realize is that he wants you to walk in this power. And if you look, the best thing about studying the Old Testament is that the Old Testament prophets walked more like sons. They walked more like Jesus did than the disciples did. I can show you, the power of God is so mechanical that you, you wouldn't even want to believe it. Right? I mean, it is so, so mechanical that we all got here at the, about the same time. How? Because we base our clocks on the sun. Who do you think set that thing in motion? And who, how many of you know it works the same every day? That's mechanical. God doesn't have to get up every morning and go, okay, Earth, go around the sun again. Remember, 365 and one quarter days. <laughs> not 363, not 370, but 365. Isn't that right? He has to, he did it, he only said it one time. And it's a law. It's working. Right? So shall my word be that goes forth out of my voice and will not return to me void, but shall accomplish that to which I've sent it and that which I, I purpose. Isn't that right? Do you realize that this, this whole thing, I will show you probably tomorrow because it's getting late here, so I've got to hurry. But It's amazing when you look at it because he wants you to walk in power. Amen. He wants you to be able to do things, and, and not just for the overall betterment of man, which is the overriding reason. We were in, several years ago, right when I did my first DHT, I went into Eureka Springs, Arkansas, in the middle of the winter, and got snowed in, and people got snowed out, and I had to cancel the meeting because of the snow and the ice, and I'm stuck in this place, and people couldn't get in, I couldn't get out, and it was a waste of time, and so I went to God, and I said, God, this will never happen again. I said, this message is too important for weather to stop it. I said, these people need this message. And so, this will never happen again. From now on, I will take authority over the weather and I will see to it that weather does not affect what we do. Amen? Amen? Now, from that time to this, we've never canceled a meeting because of weather. I mean, and it's amazing because usually you can look at the weather the week before and see what it's supposed to be. And usually it's supposed to be rain, sleet, snow, something. And now, literally, and I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating one bit. Now when I go into places, 
it's funny because I'm thinking of a special, a particular place. <clears throat> I got there, and the next morning, the day the meeting was supposed to start, I had a phone call from a friend, and he said, Curry, when, when did you get into town? And I said, well, I got in this morning. He said, yeah, I woke up and looked outside, and whenever I saw it was clear, I told my wife you were here. <laughs> Literally, I'm, I'm not kidding. And he said, did you check the weather? And I said, no, why? Because now I don't check it anymore. Used to, I did. And then I pray against it. I don't do that anymore. Now I expect it. <laughs> right? So I don't even have to fight. That's another battle I don't fight anymore. It's, I expect it to be. Now, I'm not saying it never rains or anything. And when I go to Florida, you've got to pray for rain. Because <laughs> if you don't, all the people will go to the beach instead of come to church. <laughs> so you've got, you, you got to know how to, how to balance that, okay? But... But seriously, and we were going down one day from Dallas down to San Antonio. Well, the, all of South Texas had been flooded bad. I mean, this had been going on for apparently a couple of weeks. And there were whole towns that were flooded out. I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't heard anything about it. And so we've got, I've got meetings coming up, but I've got like two days in between. So we're going by this way to get to the meetings. And I, I love San Antonio. It's, I love the architecture and all that kind of stuff and the food and so <clears throat> it's the best Mexican food you can find just about and so we were going to drive down through there and we start coming through this area and it's all you know flooded and so we start talking about it and we're like what so we turn on the radio and they say yeah this storm's come through and this is flooded and that town's flooded and it looks like another round of storms are going to be here and it looks like for about the next four or five days it's going to be more floods and it was just gray, and we're, we're driving into it, you know, and it's ugly and just bad. <clears throat> and I was hoping to get a day or so off there. And so we're going into it, and my daughter's right in the back. She goes, Dad, this ain't going to be any good. I said, look at this. It's not going to be good. Go down here. It's going to be like this. And she said, do something. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. So we're just driving. And so I didn't go into some long thing. I, just, I said, Father, you heard what she said. Just, we thank you right now for just sunshine and, and, and bright. And so <clears throat> it's funny because we're going down. And, and I told her, I said, you know, Texas, it's humid. And I said, we get down here, and after it quits raining, if the sun comes out, it's going to be humid. It's going to be hot and steamy. I said, don't be complaining when it's hot and steamy. I said, I'm not. I won't. So we get down there. Clouds open up, blue skies, beautiful weather. I mean, it's, it's a, you ought to heard the weathermen. They, well, we don't know what's going on, but uh, it looks like we have an opening and the slow fronts come in. And we, I mean, it, it was hilarious. We were listening to it and laughing, sitting there laughing about it. All right? Now, this had nothing to do with the gospel. It had to do with a son asking. Isn't that right? That's all it was. God will do that for you. Now, if they had needed rain, if they'd been in drought and it started raining, I'm not going to pray for it not to rain. Why? Because I will lay down my rights for the benefit or the betterment of humanity. If they need rain for their crops and that kind of stuff, then you pray for that, right? You don't, you don't just use it. But it's funny because then we, we go through that and we're walking down the, to the river walk there and I look back and my daughter's got her sweater thing off around her neck and she's doing this, and she looks at me, and she goes, Dad, I go, do it. <laughs> don't even do it. I said, you're getting to be like the Israelites. I said, don't even do it. <laughs> so, but I'm telling you, I could go through, I could, I could be here the three days we're supposed to be here. I could be here easily giving you nothing but weather testimonies. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Every, every type of day, the, the young man I told you that traveled with me for a while, the first time I came here, he traveled, it's hilarious, went into Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're going in, he's looking over, there's this huge cloud right over Tulsa, dark, you can tell it's raining. He looks over there, and he'd heard all my stories. So he's just sitting there, and he looks, and looks at me, and looks over there, he goes, you, you see, that, see that cloud? I said, yeah. He said, so, so how do you do this? <laughs> I'm serious, I was like, I'm like, do what? He goes, what, how, do, do you have to pray, or what? I said, It'll be gone when we get there. And he said, oh, okay. He said, did you already pray? And I said, I said no, I hadn't prayed yet. So we're driving, and his wife called on the phone. And he starts talking to her, and he starts 
yeah, we're, we're driving, yeah, and we're going, and there's this big cloud, and I, I'm, I'm fixing to see one of those weather miracles Curry's talking about, and he, he's, he, he goes, where, hang on a second. He said, where'd that cloud go? I started looking. I mean, it was an amazing thing, because this was one of those, this was weird, okay? It was different than just, a, we had gone toward it, and we never went under it, but once we got where we were going, we could look back, and it was where we went through. I'm mean, not kidding. I still, I don't understand it. All I know is what happened, right? And we had this, the last house we had in Dallas had this, uh, had a swimming pool behind it, which is why my wife picked it. She, the house wasn't anything, but it had a swimming pool, okay? She said, I would have taken, you know, a, a mobile home, you know, with a, if it had a swimming pool behind it, we'd lived in the mobile home and had the swimming pool, and I don't care if you'd had the mobile home up on blocks, you know, it wouldn't have mattered We'd have taken it. So she just wanted some kind of pool. My grandkids came down. <clears throat> this is my grandson. He's, uh, he was six at the time, I think. Six, yeah. And it's funny because it was supposed to rain. And you're not supposed to rain, you know, not supposed to swim when it's raining. <clears throat> and so she said, he asked, my wife said, can I, can I go swimming? She said, no, you can't go swimming because it's supposed to rain, so you're not going to go swimming. And so I'm in my office, and so he says, uh, he comes running there real quick, and she goes, Grandpa, Grandpa. I said, yeah, well, what, do you, what do you need? Quick, would you pray that it won't rain because I want to go swimming? <laughs> and I looked up, and I said, yeah, okay, go ahead, go swimming. I said, rain? No rain till after he's done. <laughs> Literally, that's what I said. He stood there at the door. I said, no rain till he's done swimming. So <laughs> he runs back in there and tells my wife, Grandpa said I can go swimming because it's not going to rain. <clears throat> right? And she said, well, did, did your grandpa really say that or are you just telling me he said that? He, no, he really said it's not going to rain until I finish swimming. She said, all right, we'll go get your bathing suit. So he went and got his bathing suit, went and swimming, goes out there, swims for like 45 minutes. <clears throat> she said, well, whenever you get done, you know, come back in. He comes back inside, changes clothes, down. <clears throat> now, the neatest thing about that to me, because the one thing I want to do is I want to leave a legacy of faith so that my kids and my grandkids will know that the same God that answers my prayers will answer theirs. And I want them to have faith in him. And so <clears throat> it, it's the, the, the thing in my heart that what blessed me about that is that my grandson at six years old, in his mind, I have the reputation that I can fix the weather. <laughs> and so that, that lesson, now right now, he probably doesn't think anything about it other than the fact that he got to go swimming. <clears throat> but as he gets older, he's going to remember that. And he's going to talk about that. And he's already a step above where I was whenever I was his age. And so I expect better things out of him. Amen? We've got to become people who leave a legacy of faith in God. John Lake's son, Roderick, was 17 years old. John Lake died in 1935. Roderick was on a deathbed <clears throat> at 17 in 1937, two years after his dad died. He did die, and he died, well, again, 1937. The saddest thing about that story to me is the fact that while he was on his deathbed, all of his family was around, and his statement was, I know that if my dad was here, I wouldn't have to die. That's wrong. He should have said, the same God that heard my dad's prayers, here's mine. And because of that, I won't die. But for whatever reason, he didn't get it. It just shows that faith can't be inherited per se but it can be learned and it can be walked in, but it's not automatic. And we need to make sure that we're living a life <clears throat> that is worth emulating and is worth our kids talking about. Something that's going to draw them toward God. You know, we were talking earlier at supper that um, <clears throat> we were talking with my daughter the other day and she said she is 27, will be 28, that's my youngest one. I've got a son, 30, a daughter, 20. Eight, 
or yeah, 29, going to be 29, and one's going to be 28. And <clears throat> the youngest one is one I was talking to, and she said, you know, we were talking about this. She has never seen me sick. 28 years old, and she cannot ever remember seeing me sick. And it's not, I'm telling you, one of the things I learned about Dr. Lake, I, I, I talked to all these people that studied under him, and it's amazing. These people are in their 90s. And without fail, anytime I mention Dr. Lake, the first thing he does, or the first thing they would do, actually, they would start telling me, yeah, I, I was in his church from May of 1931 until June of 1935. And I was, and matter of fact, that was when the church was over on the corner of Lincoln and Maine. And, and that was, he had, we had the big room there. And I mean, we're talking 90-year-old people. Not one of the people I ever talked to him showed any signs of senility, no, no dementia, nothing. Dr. Lake taught and believed that the Spirit of God is a tangible substance. <clears throat> that when you literally take him to be baptized by him, spirit, soul, and body, that he will obviously inhabit your spirit, but that even in the brain, that the spirit of God literally infuses the brain, the cells of the brain, with a divine life, that sickness and disease cannot dwell there. Amen. And I've never met one of them that had anything wrong with them mentally. Their mind is clear and sharp until the day they die. Now, that's a legacy that we should be walking in. We shouldn't put up with this other stuff. Amen? Amen. If we have the mind of Christ, then we ought to be filled with the Spirit of God.